the first let's see here it's 10 45 and brooks and i'd like to welcome you to the november WASD discussion and we're going to start by talking about something that isn't the WASD. we had a conab report coming out of brazil this morning so we'll talk about that very quickly it was about as expected 162 million tons of soybeans which was a little up from the prior report a little bit below the guesses but the guesses get a little wild with that uh, soybean yields, planted area, a little more, a little more acreage in action. Corn came in at 119.10, which was a little bit below the last time, way below the estimates. But again, don't pay too much attention to the estimates. It's really kind of what happens. And let's go right to where I'm worried. Yeah, let me make a bigger picture of this. This is a it's picture of I'm making that chart just to kind of give everybody an idea of that 162 million metric tons. It's about 5.9. 5 billion bushels of soybeans. So to kind of put that in perspective, a pretty big number when you compare it to the US. Yeah, we grow oh, just north of 4 billion. So, so yeah, that's a lot of beans. Looking here, this is a January soybean chart. And what we have here, we have three Mohawk wicks. A Mohawk wick is here's the head, here's the Mohawk, and it comes right back down. We've done this now really three days counting today in a row and what that says is when we see prices rally we're not finding good structure we're not finding support and it's bringing in selling pressure not unlike what we see sometimes in the wheat market as you can see today this looks like a technical chart uh topping pattern i'm going to throw on an indicator here we use a lot of indicators we're going to put on a stochastic which is a precision oscillator and when the blue line comes down through the red line and we're up here in the top when we're overbought that's a sell signal my worry with the soybeans we're looking for oh, 205 i believe is the survey number for soybeans today we'll pull that right up here the soybeans the survey for soybean ending stocks actually came in at 222 last time we were at 220 so that actually came up a little bit my concern is they're going to cut exports and that's going to make that number bigger. If that number is much bigger than let's say 230, where the soybeans are right now could attract uh, some selling pressure and could be a little bit intense. So when we look back in the chart, we have this big bar right here. This may not be so well supported. So if we go below, Oh, uh, let's see, call it 1364, which actually yeah, that's not right. What's the low? 1352, yeah. about a nickel from where we are. Uh, we could find the uh, a decided lack of buyers. So, Sterling, we looked at it from a technical point of view. Um, throw some cash marketing illustrations in here. Those three days, four days that you see represented right there, there's been a fair amount of soybeans hedged by farmers in those four days. Um, particularly, let's call it central Illinois, central Indiana. If you kind of drew that line across the country and you looked at the processing market, there were opportunities for some $14 cash beans in December and January, pretty much at the, at the processing market. Um, river markets still struggling a little bit processing and crush margins are are they continue to be really strong so we did see some farmers selling in there let's hope let's hope we get those opportunities again because i think with yields where they're at 14 it's a pretty nice number now i know we've got some folks on here from north dakota i know it's a little different story up there um but we need to we need to really kind of look at these indicators right now, like Sterling's pointing out as good times to sell rather than a flat price number. Yeah, exactly. It's about momentum and direction. And here down below, I put up an, R an RSI, which is a relative strength indicator. And as you can see, we're brushing up pretty close to that red line. And that is an indication that we are, you know, getting a little cooked to the top side here. And what I like to see, if I see three things in a row, I see RSI telling me to sell, I see overbought stochastics about ready to give me a sell, and a weak technical pattern, that gives me something that if I were a hedge fund manager and I told Ken Griffin I was gonna sell some soybeans, 
I'd be okay with that. Yeah. Yeah. Dylan just uh, Dylan from uh, Central Illinois. Um, now they would say he's from Southern Illinois if you're from Chicago, Sterling. But okay. Dylan's from the northern half of Illinois officially. I call it Central Illinois. Uh, he said that farmers did get with it on cash sales over the last three days, but they're pretty downtrodden on corn. And we're going to talk about corn here in just a little bit. Uh, yeah, why don't we just go ahead and we'll go ahead and talk about corn here. This is, while not terribly unexpected, this is what a grinding bear market looks like. Corn continues to be a hand-to-mouth export situation. You'll see in today's export sales numbers, we had okay sales. We saw China was not in here buying. They've come in, they've been real good the last two days buying soybeans. But China does not appear to have much interest in corn. And that is going to create a bit of a global glut. We combine this with interest rates. You're not going to be that inclined to go out and borrow money. That's the purpose of higher interest rates is to tame that sort of behavior. And that means going out and buying too far forward when you have plenty of supply is not necessarily a good idea. So I'm not saying we're completely cooked in the export market, but every week we go and not really advance the ball. We're compressing our time here and... You know, are we going to see big spring Chinese buying of corn, which we have seen in the past? Well, that number depends entirely on that 119 number in Brazil. That number creeps up to 122-ish. Well, then things can get a little bit different. If it creeps down, then maybe we can see some Chinese buying, and that would work to be supportive towards prices. Sterling, I really like this chart. Um, I, I hate the chart, but I like it at the same time. Because I think what this does, this gives us insight into how we're going to have to market in the future. And we just talked about, Sterling talked about a few different indicators in here. Folks, those indicators were, were going off like crazy that first week of June. They were going off like crazy again in July. Now, it, what the, what's so tough with this market is when we were facing the inverses that we faced and, and the really good years, the last two and a half years have given us, it was really hard to pull the trigger when you're selling old crop at 650 to $7 cash. Do you really want to sell 590 to 610 corn in the summer? And a lot of folks didn't, but I have a feeling that on soybeans and corn going forward, we're going to have to look at these opportunities and not flat price, but the environment around the prices that we've got as to tell us when to pull that trigger to sell. That is exactly right. If uh, we get a bounce, a bounce is a good opportunity. And obviously these were incredibly good things back here, but right in here, you know, there was your chance. That, that's, you know, $5, which doesn't seem that great. But it's better than 470 these ranges until we get something that is going to affect supply materially that would either be something that hurts production or something that does something to ramp up exports we are probably looking at smaller ranges and we're going to be trying to pick up nickels and dimes instead of quarters and half dollars you know and, sterling we'd never have enough time on these to cover everything we need to but something you and i were chatting about today is and I think you just mentioned it. You talked about the times of the year that are going to threaten these supplies. And um, I know that everybody on this call, uh, it was kind of textbook information. It's June and July, and that corn chart shows it right there, June and July. But we've also got a couple new months to throw on there. We may be experiencing a little bit of that uh, right now in November, but. December and January are a couple of new big volatility months that we need to watch out for. Yeah, here I'm going to put up a generic futures chart for December futures, then we're going to look at it seasonally. And this will go back and we'll take this back. Oh, you know, five years is good enough. You can see where we have pronounced bounces, and we'll uh, convert this to a high low average. You can see where we get better periods. We get the spring nervousness, we get the fall nervousness, and sometimes we get a little bit of a 
premature bit going on here, but you can see we have good periods and adverse periods. And Sterling, I just got a text message in here, and, for, and the question was, understand why June and July is where it's at. The question is, why the new volatility in, say, November, December? And I think that goes back to the 5.9 billion bushels uh, produced in Brazil. That's so, good. all of a sudden, we've got a weather market now in December and the first part of January. Exactly, and we've seen there's been some um, unwelcome moisture in some parts of Brazil that's hampered soybean planting. They're gonna have to do some replanting, things of that sort. And that was enough to get, you know, enough of a story to get the market propelled a little bit. And that's something we have to be aware of. Aware of. We are, you know, the entire Western hemisphere is where the most of the soybeans come from. And we have to be just as aware of the situation in Brazil as we are of our own domestic situation. In fact, maybe sometimes we need to be more aware of that in Brazil since they are producing ever more soybeans. And something else that I've thrown in the uh, podcast is crush margin. Soybean meal exports are something we're winning. We're doing better with those and solid crush margins on a local basis, you will see better processing numbers, and that's why you're getting those $14. That's something else that we need to be aware of. And the, the dynamics, as always, they do evolve. Well, Sterling, as we get right down through this thing, we've got about three and a half minutes left. When we look at this report today, obviously, we're going to be looking at yields in the U.S. on corn and soybeans primarily. But that export number, and, and those are obvious things, right? And we're looking at 173.33 bushel per acre on corn, I believe was where we were at. Soybeans just under 50 at 49.56. We're gonna be watching those closely. I think a lot of people on this call maybe think that these numbers could go up a little bit. The second thing we need to watch for and it probably has more bearing long-term are those exports. Sterling, let's talk about those exports as far as what we are what we were expecting coming in, maybe what the November numbers look like. Well, right now we're at 2025. That was the last number for corn exports, leaving us with the corn ending stocks at 2111, and exports are for 2140. Now, this guess right here has your yield per acre up a little bit three tenths when i did my balance sheets and my numbers are figured into these i was at 173 spot three so we may see a little bit more production but if we cut this number again not only is that obviously going to push uh, ending stocks up a little bit that is going to create nervousness because we've now had several months where these are cut and we continue to see that that's something that may be very hard to put back into this balance sheet, and that could be a real issue. Same story with soybeans. We're at uh, 1755 and yields 49 spot 56. So basically about the same. Uh, I actually raised corn yields a little bit. I actually nudged a little bit back off on the soybean yields because of some problems in Minnesota. But again, if we cut you know 50 off of this. And these numbers say basically the same. Suddenly, that ending stocks number goes up from 220 to 270, and the key number I'm looking at for today is 235. That's kind of the fulcrum number. We stay under that; it won't be a problem for the bean market. We get close to that or above that, um, we could see some issues probably very quickly. You know, we've got got just a minute and a half here. The impact of this report's big. And uh, what I mean by that is, is all of your folks with revenue protection on corn, their protection has run out. If you've got unsold bushels, and we saw this market drop 17% from February to October, all of a sudden we find ourselves now with um, no protection at all. And I think that's gonna, I, I think that could hurt some people going forward. I hate to be a seller at these levels, but the risk of this market going down 30 to 40 cents without any protection whatsoever, it's real. Um, it's real and it, uh, it, it really hinges on what China does with corn over the next few months. And there is no indication right now that China steps in and buys that. 
I don't put that out there as a scare tactic, but I think we all have to know that when we're talking to producers, we have no protection on old crop after that October average is over. And we are in a spot though, and here we have a report. Corn ending stocks at 25, 21, two spot one, five, six, a little bigger than expected. Uh, soybean ending stocks, 245. And looking at the soybean market, we're down 23 cents right here off of that. So that number is bigger. Those export numbers, look at that corn, it went up. There's your surprise for today's report. We're up 50 on corn. Soybean exports, they left those unchanged. Yields on beans, 49 spot nine. Yields on corn, 174 spot nine. So a little bit, uh, a little bit bigger than expected. So there is your, uh, you know, so frankly, the difference between 21, uh, 2156 and 2140 isn't enough to be that big of a deal. Corn right now is down about seven on the beans, but for the beans, it's going from uh, 220 to 245. Again, that's a bit nervous. And the, uh, uh, let's look here. at those bean exports. We're right on the money there. That's interesting. Yeah. So what that means is the only other place you can take that uh, where you can shrink the balance sheet on beans is you either shrink exports or you shrink crush. That's not going right? to happen. And well, here's the deal. We added 29 million bushels into production. We added those basically right, we added those right back in here. So crush was left untouched. And uh, all of this came from that little bit of a bump in yields. I, is... I had this gut feel that corn was gonna come in higher. And I'm always wrong on these reports, Starling. Starling, I am always wrong on them, but I just had that feeling that it could be a little higher than the 173. It seems like we got a little trigger happy to take it down to 173. And yeah. and um, I think a lot of people were kind of expecting a, a little bit of a jolt there. I yeah, have no this... idea where the corn exports come from. I mean, while it's a small amount, 50 million bushels, it's it's significant. I have no earthly idea where those are going to come from. Most likely the, when they adjusted the exports, you look at prices, if prices continue to stay depressed, you put your balance sheet together. Sometimes you're willing to add some back in. That's all that is. And the fact that the dollar has been relatively tame, that, that is all that is. And remember, this is a guess and you need to look at commitments and this is throwing out 50 million bushels of hope. That's what it is really. Um, so. looking at the, looking at other commodities on here, let's take a look at that cotton production number. Cotton that production, cotton production number is significantly bigger, higher, significantly higher cotton ending stocks, significantly higher. Anybody who reads the DMOs knows that, uh, two things have been having a race to zero. That's cotton and crude oil. This number, I don't have a fresh cotton quote, but this number is in no way, shape or form bullish or supportive to the cotton market. We are oversold. That's the only good news. In the last two weeks, we've had good export sales for cotton, and particularly China coming in here and buying the cotton. The question is, will they in fact take the cotton? And that gets into a much more complicated global demand situation that for cotton really is not very good and not getting better. It's in fact getting a little worse. So th this number won't do too much for cotton. Wheat ending stocks at 684. A little bit of a bounce here, exports unchanged. Yield per acre at 48.6, production unchanged. So we managed to uh, cut off, oh, I probably took down food or uh, when I did my wheat balance sheet, I cut, cut down feed. There's not a lot of reasons to be feeding wheat unless it's something localized to corn prices where they are. So most likely, I haven't looked at the uh, full report, but most likely that was a cut in feed. Yeah, I think we got to look at this and everybody wants to look for some silver lining in here. And, I, and it, it sounds like a broken record. But I guess the the uh, the corn export is the surprise you mentioned it of the day. The bottom line, though, is you know whether you're at 220 million on soybean carryout, and it's 220 million bushels, or whether you're at 240, 250, things are still tight. I mean, it's still a, a tight balance sheet. Any hiccup that we see in Brazil, um, and, and it really, I think this market over the next 60 to 75 days folks is going to be dominated by whatever happens in Brazil and Argentina. We need to yeah. kind of keep our eyes on that extended forecast. The market's going to tell us what that forecast is before we see it. But um, 
it's really something we're going to have to focus on the next 60 days and put our hopes in any kind of rally across the board in a little issue in South American weather. Yeah. And now here looking at the soybean chart, the stochastics are just about to give a sell signal. The RSI, when you see it bounce off like this, typically, as you can see, this cycles between red and green. We're now drifting lower towards the green, which is not good for prices. Looking at this chart, we're going to have support. Oh, right around 1330 and then at 13 dollars. Those are the numbers most likely we'll test, especially, you know, you get the knee jerk reaction. If uh, we see continued selling pressure, you know, over the next couple hours, that will be the problem for that. Moving back to corn, as you can see, the corn market right here is you can see right where. Major support is, and often prices move and work in tiers. As you can see here, we had our four seventy to five dollar tier. We leak much through this. We could find ourselves in a new four sixty to four eighty tier, or maybe even a little bit lower if demand remains a little bit weak. So, no big shocks on the corn balance sheet. Soybeans bigger than expected and getting the reaction we expected. Cotton actually probably uh, the one that's having the most trouble. Dylan, I think Sterling just kind of answered your question in the chat box. Uh, how critical is the 468 support level? And I think you just kind of kind of went over that. It is the, the market, you know, the, probably if it declines, I doubt if it's going to crash. Through here, you know, 10, 12 cents in a day. More likely, what we're going to have is that painful, slow, stealthy grind lower. One other thing to keep in mind ethanol use and ethanol consumption. Crude oil has fallen off a cliff when nobody would expect it to fall off a cliff. Gasoline demand has not been all that stout. If that continues to erode, you know, we throw another 100 million back into that balance sheet. Or we just don't see the ethanol offtake that we would really expect. That could present, you know, the issue on the balance sheet that could, you know, wiggle this thing lower. So that's just something to keep in mind here. As far as wheat, well, wheat, it's wheat. What I what I'm fearing is the corn market is slowly morphing into something that mirrors the wheat market. As you can see, every time we get a bounce with wheat, there's somebody there happy to sell you wheat at all the wheat you want at that price. And the wheat number was a little bit bearish. And that is, uh, you know, rating on things. As far as the world numbers go, because, yes, these do matter, corn ending stocks at 315, a little bit higher than last time around, a little higher than expected. Soybean ending stocks at 115, actually a smidge lower, so that's mildly, ever so mildly supportive. Mm -hmm. And as far as wheat ending stocks at 259, a little bit higher, which is a little bit bearish. Cotton ending stocks at 82, up from 80. Again, no good news and little change on production. It was unchanged and a little more than expected. Yeah, Sterling, I just got a text that says, you know, and practically speaking, how do you market this crop over the next 60 to 90 days? And I think we go back, we kind of covered it already, but to summarize it, um, I think we're going to have to take bigger chunks of your crop in the bin that's unsold. And so instead of maybe small bites at 5% and farmers are notorious for wanting to kind of make a sale without really changing the balance sheet too much. And so we kind of piecemeal a crop together. I would, uh, I would take larger percentages of what you've got unsold. Um, this report today didn't really change anything that we, that, you know, that we, no, we didn't, there wasn't anything there we didn't expect. We are still going to see those those quick uh, moves like we saw the last three days over the next 90 days. I think we've got to be prepared to sell larger chunks of the crop. Uh, it's easier to do on soybeans for a farmer than it is on corn because the prices uh, are more enticing. On corn, I think you're going to have to think outside the box here. And... Um, do some things that maybe you haven't done in the past. This market, Sterling, reminds me of the market that we saw in early 2020. 
where we had a corn market that was stuck between 340 and 390 for the longest time. Remember, this is pre-COVID, right on the precipice of, of COVID going worldwide. We had it in China. It was affecting that Chinese market, but there was simply no volatility, no opportunities. It was that slow grind, lower, little bit of a fluctuation. And you had to look at some things that, you know, kind of take you out of your comfort level. I remember that year doing what uh, some people call a three-way trade with, uh, you know, selling a put um, um, or buying a put and selling a put at the same time while selling a call above the market. Some of you are familiar with that. I think we're going to have to look at things like that to, to give this thing any kind of flavor at all on corn over the next 60 to 90 days. Yeah, I would agree uh, completely because when you do that three-way, selling the call and then putting on a bear put spread, you bring in some money or you get, or you at least put the hedge on for free, kind of depends on where things are priced. But that gives you, you know, a cheap way to at least get some coverage in here. Um, simply because the, the, the direction of least resistance, the corn is sideways to lower. We're going to need something to cut these global supplies a little bit to get them back to, say, 308 from where they are. That's going to mother nature or something's going to have to change in the demand picture. We're going to have to see, happen. you know, the Chinese government is essentially uh, pump money into that economy. And uh, it's all about hogs over there. Uh, we're going to have to see them. They're going to have to throw their weight around on the livestock market to need that U.S. corn. The the most pleasant surprise we could have over the next 70, 90 days outside of maybe a little adverse conditions down in South America. You always want to, you don't want to wish somebody too much ill will, but that's going to rally beans to get something fundamentally going on corn. It has to be a, it has to be a Chinese um, export package that we put together. And uh, it's possible. Uh, you know, things that are a little depressed over there over the last 6 to 12 months um, to keep the peace. You never know what could happen. Uh, odds aren't high for anything like that, but that would be the big surprise. That would be something, and we, we do see the Chinese doing that. And again, the hogs are one of their uh, one of their mechanisms that they use and driving food down. Prices down is something that is good for the economy. So that is something that will have an effect we are getting into a time of year you know if they're going to want to increase farrowings and things like that seasonally that's good but we may not see any help for the corn mark with that until march march is going to outlast a lot of farmers ability um, to get through cash flow situations especially with rates where they're at um i can see i can see farmers taking a lot of this to the market uh, because they have to have cash. And, uh, you know, that's that's how the market works. Uh, when the price is low, we typically have more sellers. And uh, we may see some tougher days ahead of us here over the last 60 days. And uh, it may be because of that, that corn being on the market with, uh, with little demand. Yes. And... But some good news, we've seen diesel prices come down, natural gas prices haven't gotten out of hand. There's a glut of fertilizer in Brazil. So hopefully, and uh, it's time to start looking at next year, uh, perhaps our input costs can be a little bit more friendly than what we have, uh, than what we've been dealing with in the past. You know, Sterling, through this whole thing, I think we look back on this and we are not in the marketplace like we've been in, in the last four years or, or three and a half. And if we do see though that rally, and that can happen, I think about a 2003 uh, following a 2002 rougher crop in the U.S. If you look back into the 90s, I think you're going to see that in 93, 94, where you have pretty good prices. They, they typically don't last multiple years. If we see a situation where we get that, a poor crop in Brazil, a poor crop in the U.S., that's the time to trigger multi-year sales. And that's something that uh, has really bit you uh, pretty hard over the last three years to sell ahead. Um, we're in a different environment than we were over the last three years. And here, I'm going to punch up one chart here that may, again, when I have to... Uh... 
when I have to start pulling this sort of stuff out, that means I'm kind of reaching. But this is the current net fund short position. It's enormous. It is, can everyone see that? Can you see that, Brooks? I cannot. Hold on here. Let's try that. Let's try that. There you go. Uh, there we go. Okay. This is an enormous short position, short 182,000 contracts. Not a record, but it's big enough to produce some fuel. Now, as you can see, typically we do see things can improve as we're moving, as long as we don't have a year, you know, like 2019. But uh, again, 2019 was a unique year. People don't think about this, but as we were heading into the COVID situation, we were actually slipping into a recession. Um, you know, if we could get something to create some risk aversion or prices don't grind into a new lower tier, we may be able to get some fund covering. And this is why you need to pay attention every day because we're not going to get a big bounce. But if you could sell it, you know, 12, 15 better than you could two days before, where we are right now, where prices are 12 to 15 cents matters. So again, this is a time to, uh, you know, pay very close attention to what's going on, because there are some things that can create some volatility, none of them any good, but it is something that could create some volatility. I think this is a, a great way to kind of segue into the end, but I, I know there's some folks on here. We've got a lot of folks on here today. Uh, got folks from outside the company on here, Sterling. We've got Folks from grain companies on here. I see uh, someone from a seed company. We've even got a, a competitor or two on here, and everybody's welcome on these calls. But uh, one thing that I see on this net net fund position, Sterling mentioned it. This was one of our old indicators. Um, so Aaron, Justin, you guys know the old indicator system that we used to have. Stay tuned. Um, we will be introducing something like this in the future because I think it's going to be a great tool to help guide sales in the future. But spec funds were always one of these uh, indicators. And Sterling, the illustration that we put out there was a fuel tank. And when your mm -hmm. fuel tank was above half full, it was a good time to be a seller. Someone is putting money in your fuel tank, take it. When yes. your fuel tank is below that half full and it's getting closer to empty, not a good time to be a seller. And you're illustrating one that's about as empty as it's been in the last one, two, three, four, five, six years at this time. Uh, yeah, this is the lowest it's been in five years and well below the five year average, which is the blue line on here. So, again, if Wall Street wants to buy your corn and wants to overpay for it, well, certainly let them let them do that. That's what they like Absolutely. to do. Absolutely. So, so this is something that will merit uh, some watching here. And the chart looks like this. This comes out every Tuesday. And then on Fridays, we get the actual report from what's going on. These reports are a little bit delayed, and I try to calculate open interest to kind of get a little better feel of what's going on, you know, in the deep market internals. So, okay, Sterling, as we round this thing out, um, our daily market email, you do an awesome job with that. Tuesdays, technicals, Wednesdays, just kind of a roundabout of everything going on out there. Thursdays, exports, Friday, spec funds. If somebody's got to pick one of these days, I know everybody. I know everybody opens them every single day and reads every word. But if you were in a bind for time, in theory, which day of the week would you open up that daily email for important information? Well, uh, the fact of the matter is, you need to open them every day <laughs> because every day is different. Mondays are Mondays, and we kind of set up and talk See, about what's going folks, I on. I put him on the spot, and he could not come through with an answer on this one. He just, just for the record, he's always got it, but but he, he me, likes them all. Let me finish with my answer. On Tuesday, we look at the funds and the market technicals very specifically. On Wednesday, the report is long, and everything is covered in detail including some big ideas and things like that, and some additional items are thrown in. On Thursdays, we look and concentrate solely on exports. On Friday, we review and recap and what to kind of look forward to the next week. These markets are something you need to pay attention. I try to make them as compact as I can make them without making them, you know, a lack of information, but I try to keep them from being too tedious as well, because I don't like reading tedious things. But most importantly, listen to the podcast twice a day, 
because that will be the absolute most updated information. Good information going forward. Read them every day was his answer still at the end. But uh, keep your eyes open on these indicators that are in the market. Uh, we're going to do a third Thursday marketing meeting. Is that coming up next week, uh, Sterling? It is coming up and, next uh, week. Going to talk about some weather in South America uh, on that one. So make sure that you join us, and that's at 9 a.m. next Thursday. Yeah. So uh, be on that call. That is the 16th, if I'm not mistaken. That is correct. Yes, that would be the third Thursday. And we're going to have um, Jeff Dorn from Planalytics talking about South American weather and American weather and how things are changing and uh, what's uh, really happening here. All right. Well, we're going to sign. I'm going to sign off from Southern Illinois. And uh, Sterling's going to say goodbye from Omaha, wherever you're at across the country. Have a great day. Thank you.